I was. I was at once at one with waving ocean sun, when once I wore the woven promise core that style since left behind. I was one, I find, as a weary son is won and prized by father outsourced, resized. We were, I was, outside. It's a wonderful poem. I'm so proud of myself for hitting it first time because it was a de deliberate tongue twister. Mm -hmm. And I always trip up on the ones that are just accidental. Yeah, exactly. Just like any alliteration, usually I'm just <laughs> struggling here for 15 minutes. So, yeah. So, hey everyone, welcome back to Solocene. This is the 11th episode in our nature series. I was kind of, I, I suppose it's not that relevant to the nature semester, but it was just like I was thinking about what was, what we were. So it's it's kind of pertinent to today's primary question, which is about bringing back um, either forgotten or just abandoned or perhaps practices about the human nature dynamic that have been deemed obsolete or something like that. And in the poem, it's kind of using the metaphor of what we wear, our mm -hmm. clothes. And I didn't go into that today for, for this question, because I think we're probably going to have a fashion entire semester down the line. But I thought it was a nice metaphor, and I was kind of happy it just like came out of me, this term, um, promise core. I like that, because promise Because it's, it's kind of like norm core, or like um, a cottage core, or, or one of these aesthetic terms, usually fashion-based. And I think it's a, it's a cool synonym for like sustainability fashion. Mm -hmm. Promise core. It kind of sounds a little bit like make a wish. <laughs> but it's like universal and it's, I don't know, it just sounds nice. It definitely sounds nice. And speaking of nice, we have a zine to accompany this semester. If you're interested in purchasing it, you can do so in the link below. All the proceeds go to Eco Justice, which is an organization we're really excited to support with the sale of this zine. And it's all about nature and our perspective on how we can kind of better integrate ourselves into it and be a bit more mindful when we're out and about. And that's going to be further discussed today in our first question. We also, if you would like, you can subscribe to us on YouTube or on whatever podcasting platform you use. It really helps. We like to share the word. If you like the podcast, yeah, share it with a friend. That's like the digital zine podcast exactly so you can either subscribe or leave a comment tell us what you think or you can also email us through the link in the description to the episode yeah so we recommends do we have one of those for this week for this week yeah. we can recommend columbus perhaps that was a really great movie yeah we can recommend columbus it came out in 2017 um it's not i wouldn't say it's it's quite so relevant or like hearty a recommendation as last week's geographies of solitude a film but it is very cool, and it does tackle some Solocene themes, like it's kind of about architecture and modernism, particularly how it relates to humanity, human relationships especially. It touches a little bit on technology, and mm -hmm. it's a very green movie, which is which is always good. Not it's... like ideologically necessarily, but <laughs> just visually, pigmentarily, it's, it's very green. <laughs> and there's one line in particular that stood out to both of us when we kind of looked over at each other with wide eyes, and they said, I just hate cars. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and the other person was like, me too. Yeah, and I so... Said, we were like, me three. <laughs> um, yeah, Columbus. It was directed also by someone called Koganada, who started out doing visual essays on YouTube, like video essays, and that was something that was kind of an inspiring story because to go from YouTube to making feature-length movies that are widely distributed and acclaimed, it seems like it's a rare thing. It seems like it's an example of that artistically kind of um, democratizing effect people always talk about the internet having, but you rarely ever actually see it yeah I feel like the internet it hasn't exactly kind of blown open those creative industries in the way that people were hoping so but that's a topic for another day yeah <laughs> today we're talking about things that we should bring back so we're being the opposite of creative we're just mm -hmm. mining humanity's dark sordid history <laughs> for some bright spots that we think the solo scene will retain yeah my first one was offerings to nature and of nature <laughs> okay because i mean with most of mine, they're not just old, they're currently practiced by different groups of people all over the world. But maybe not mainstream in our Western homogeny, yeah. something like that. Or how you say, I don't do it. Yeah, so okay. that's like, <laughs> these are things, usually in this whole scene, I'm speaking to myself and okay. then hope that there's other Alicia's out there who maybe will receive it. But yeah, offerings to and of nature. Mm -hmm. So when you are harvesting, which obviously in the soul scene we will be, harvesting a bit more than we are today you mean more people will be doing it yeah or okay. just oh there's some pretty wildflowers i'm going to go pick a few for my table by plucking 
plucking. See, I think of harvesting food related flowers, I think plucking, but maybe <laughs> maybe harvesting also works. Harvesting just seems like it's too efficient a word for flowery. flowery. Foraging? Yeah, but do you forage for nice flowers? No, you pluck them. You pluck. Okay, but so I in don't this whole scene, when nitpick. you're plucking or retrieving, it could be, I like these rocks, when kids collect rocks or okay. seashells. Yes. So I think leaving an offering, so in Canadian Indigenous culture, a lot of them, the groups would leave tobacco as an offering, but it could be just a prayer or just like some nice words like, thank you flowers for being so pretty as an offering to them when you retrieve them and being mindful of not plucking all of them because there's other people and you want them to remain beautiful in their natural habitat. And then offerings of, this could be setting aside some of your meal and just <laughs> saying like, maybe not setting it aside. What am I trying to I feel like to? this is just a broad religious suggestion. It's, <laughs> that be, it's like a paradigm shift in people's spirituality that you're recommending. <laughs> but the essence of offering. Yeah. You're like, so I think in the solar scene we'll be leaving offerings to the old gods. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I mean, but I mean like having a bit more reverence for the things we're consuming. Okay. But like you mean like at Thanksgiving when you say thanks around the table, more, more things like that? Yes. Okay. More things like that. And I think it will allow us to connect with nature on a spiritual level, not just a physical one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, my first one, I really wanted to talk about farming for this. And I kind of went down a, an internet rabbit hole and I was just reading about old farming methods, new farming methods. I didn't know anything about farming, mm -hmm. like almost nothing. So it was quite enlightening. But like I was thinking about like tilling. You know, like they till the land and soil erosion we were talking about last week. And I was thinking about how farming for so many centuries, millennia even, was almost completely sustainable. Mm -hmm. And how today it's almost the opposite. But it just seemed like too broad a topic for me to like go into detail. And I also didn't want to sound like or try and, try and present myself as like, as like an authority. Like, oh, why do we do this now? We should be doing this. I feel that way about some things, obviously, or else I wouldn't have a podcast. But mm -hmm. about farming, I don't feel quite that way. Um, I don't feel I'm at that level. Why have I mentioned it, you asked? I don't know. I suppose I shouldn't have mentioned it at <laughs> all. But yeah, I feel like, let me just say in a broad way, some farming techniques. Crop rotation. You're saying it, not me. I don't know. <laughs> because I think farms, the problem is like, I think a lot of those things that like in, in lecture halls, um, it's easy for undergrads to talk about like, oh, crop rotation and, you know, why do we till and why do we use artificial pesticides and fertilizers and stuff like this? Like it's so easy to say, but then you try and feed a country the size of Canada or America and it's like, well, for one thing, I think industrial scale farming, I think they do rotate crops quite often. Like I don't think it is just this evil artificial um, monoculture like people like to say it is. Yeah. So I, I just don't think it's so easy a topic. Yeah, there's but definitely... But I just think that there are some old things which perhaps could also be useful in the solar scene. Yeah, I mean, completely organic farming is a bit silly in terms of its sustainability for feeding people. And also, it's just kind of like a set of rules. It doesn't actually mean too much. So there's definitely a middle ground that will be achieved in the coming years if we want to have a sustainable yeah. soil, but also sustainable human lives i feel like that's about as bold as we're willing to <laughs> step off the fence yeah there is a middle ground that's about that's about it <laughs> we'll do a food semester yeah, in the that, future that was, that's so that's when we will dive into that yep my next thing <laughs> because these are all kind of weirdly religious i'm sorry i knew they were going to be with you <laughs> i knew it you're like how'd you come up with nine it just happened so my next one is washing feet inspired by Jesus. Jesus, that story in the Bible, but also just inspired by history. Yes, and also in the solar scene, as we've spoken of before, people will be barefoot, barefoot a lot more. Exactly. So the reason I say washing feet is because of the bare feet and also the the barrier that will come down between us and nature. Right now, it's like, oh, you're going to be doing some gardening? You're going to wear garden gloves because you don't want to get your fingers dirty and so on. So I think in the solar scene, the barrier between our skin and nature will fall the veil will fall and we will just get dirty and therefore need to wash our feet wash our fingernails wash our hair and so on the veil is lifted because right now when you get a shower it's just like yeah i'm a little little crusty but 
I want us to need to shower. Like when I was working in the garden this summer, I would love to come home and just have dirt in like my shins. Yes. Um, my wrist, just everywhere is dirty. But you always make fun really of me good. for being dirty. <laughs> you always make fun of me for being that guy from Charlie Brown who was a dirt cloud <laughs> flying around him. But you don't go out in the dirt. It just kind of <laughs> attracts from our, our... That's true. I don't know where it comes from. Yes, okay. We do the same thing. So getting dirty is what you're saying. And getting then washing dirty. each other. Okay. Mm-hmm. But what do you yeah. think this has to do with oh, nature? Because it may, that's what makes us dirty. Yeah. Okay. So getting dirty in nature. We used to just do it. But mm-hmm. now we have so many different ways to kind of avoid it. Yes. So I think we don't need to avoid it. Just embrace the dirt. Yeah. Too many neat freaks these days. But I'm going to call you out on this. I'm going to call you to task. Describe to me the specifics of this feet washing. Who does it? Where? When? How? I think homes will have a mudroom. Okay. A lot of homes where we grew up have one. Maybe you didn't call it a mudroom. But it's just like the space where you come in and everything's kind of dirty. Take your shoes off there. Take your shoes off there. Okay. Or you wash your feet. So we just have a little floor floor faucet. A, a what? A floor faucet. <laughs> okay. A lot of homes have these. Sure. Maybe not ones that you have been in okay. and, or our <laughs> listeners have been in. But I've seen quite a few usually on farms or on beach houses where when you come in either right before the door or right after, there's a tap like where you detach okay. your hose. But what's underneath it? A drain and a little basin. A basin? Yeah. So the f- the floor has a kind of indent? Yeah. Okay. Or a little raised kind of a sink. Raised sink. So which one? Either or. Okay. There's some architectural variability sure. in this okay. vision. So you just wash your feet when you come in. It's not washing each other's feet. Oh, I thought it's it was. Just, no. Okay. <laughs> so it's not that religious. Though. It's not that religious. It's just funny because it was okay. two in a row. But you just wash your feet when you come in and then you can kind of go barefoot around your house. I know in America, Mm. it's very common to even wear your shoes in your house. In Canada, it's not so much. Just take your shoes off when you come in. How do you dry them? Probably just have a towel. A towel? Yeah. What about spreading like warts and stuff? There won't be warts. No warts (laughs) in the solar scene? Well, it's in your own house. Yeah, but what about guests? Guests will... Community solar scene? If you know you have athlete's foot okay don't go to the ymca don't go into my house or wear socks do public buildings have these um yeah why not so you're going to the bank (laughs) (laughs) i haven't thought that far ahead okay maybe going to the bank or going to the grocery store is different than coming out from a day playing in the you know what i just feel like sometimes some concrete details about the solar scene we speak about (laughs) rather than the usual broad strokes barefoot feet washing no cars you know like let's go into some some dirty beats Okay. Or clean ones in this case. Yeah. So banks, no. I'd say no. If you're going to be there for less than well, half ba- an do hour. Do banks exist? Maybe that's... That's another question. Libraries, I'd say. Um, Libraries? The thing with bare feet in public is that it does, in fact, spread things. Because mm. their feet are very sensitive. But I think shoes... Don't need to be in the libraries. You can just wear socks or slippers. Have your indoor be shoes. Be quiet. Yeah. So, which is a good thing for libraries. Mm-hmm. Okay, my next one is I was really trying to be like positive with this and not negative because the more I thought about it, the more I just thought everything, everything from the past should come back. Um, <laughs> what do I like that we do today? Almost nothing. Like I was just thinking <laughs> when I was thinking about like food, farming, products, making people, I was like, We've pretty much just made ourselves worse, I think, in a lot, okay. in, in a lot of cases. <laughs> but I didn't want to be like, well, in the solo scene, we won't do this anymore. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I wanted to be like, we will do this. But this is my one negative one. So we won't be squeamish anymore. Okay. Because I think that's a fairly recent phenomena that has come about on such a wide scale. Like almost everybody now is kind of touchy about dead animals or blood or like bird corpses. I know I already said dead animals, but like <laughs> dealing with insects, like everyone's scared about, about that. Yeah. Or like you, you walk through a forest and you don't really want to go off the path because maybe there's a giant cobweb or there's some creepy mushrooms or thorns and you just don't want to, maybe not thorns, but like, mm. you know, I'm talking about the squeamishness. Yeah. I had a spider dream last night. A terrifying one? No. Hmm. It was that I was camping and then my uncle calls me and says, or calls my dad, who is an exterminator, and says... There's a spider here. I need you to come kill it. My dad is afraid of spiders. So I'm like, I'll just, I'll go do it. And I go. My uncle's all freaked out. It's not even my uncle in anywhere. It's theoretically my uncle in this dream. 
And then I go and I'm like hunting on the spider, trying to kill it. But then I decide to just capture it and bring it back to the campground. No, that's where <laughs> I am. Was I there? No, you weren't there. Okay. It was this weird like past where. No, I understand. Yeah. It was a dream. It was past. a dream. <laughs> but also I was thinking about eating everything. As I mentioned in our previous episode, like mm-hmm. everyone says like, no, I don't want to eat the eye. I don't want to eat the liver. But in the past, we didn't have that luxury. Mm-hmm. And so there wasn't that like. It's a very privileged thing when you think about it. Yeah. Because when sure. I say in the past, like in most parts of the world today, they don't have that mm-hmm. luxury. It's just in these these few countries, hashtag first world problems, where people are like, oh, I don't I don't want to eat the the stringy bits or whatever. I'm yeah. talking explicitly about you now, directly to <laughs> you. <laughs> just insulting you at this point. Yeah, I know. But insulting you, you will just eat everything. And I'm squeamish about things as well. It's like yeah. I would I would think twice about eating an eye. Mm-hmm. Or like you walk through a butcher's and it's like oh man that's like a a dead hanging rabbit or bird and it's like it's not really it doesn't really affect me but it's it's so out of the ordinary that it's it's notable and i don't think it should be notable in that way in the solar scene anybody like that yeah i mean even in the grocery stores we sell the imperfect bags of apples versus the perfect ones yeah it's like just eat the bruises yeah well yeah you don't I'm working on it. No, I know, but it's like <laughs> even I've like found myself doing that, and especially my few years in, on campus, where it was like food was so you can just get it everywhere, and we had a meal plan. So it's like you're not really paying for each apple, kind of. Um, it's like you have an apple, and there's maybe a, a bad part of it, and you cut that off. And I think that's an awful, awful practice. Yeah. My dad saw me doing it one time at home when I was eating a banana, and I kind of left that little nub. Yeah. And he was just like, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't know. And then he just <laughs> kind of watched me eat it. And he was just like nodded. And I was like, yeah, but that's right though. Like, yeah. Why throw it? Like, that's very, it's very bad practice. Yeah. I like that for this whole scene. I also, on the note of food, said that we'll eat more seasonally, which we say, I feel like every yeah, episode. But it's just not just eating seasonally, but being forced into scarcity and forced into <laughs> <laughs> creativity, okay. I should say. Because it's like, we're not going to have all the berries year round, but apples keep really well. So you have to find new ways to use apples in the colder months or whatever fruit or vegetable might keep. So it's not like scarcity. I don't think we should be hungry in this whole scene. But it's like, there's certain months where there's only going to be a few things that you can draw from. Mm -hmm. So it'll force you to be creative or just go without. Whereas now, if you want a mango, you get a mango, even if it's going to be imported or what have you frozen there's lots of ways to get what you want and the creativity also goes with preserves of of that practice of preserving food and salting meat and so on i think that's really good because it forces you to think about the food when you get it and it'll be even just a economically better choice for people because right now we're out here buying eight dollar bags of apples in the winter (laughs) Whereas we could have perhaps bought them for $3 in the summer, canned them. Can you can apples yourself? Yeah. You Candied can them. Anything. Candied them, dried P- them. Pickled. Can you pickle them? I don't know apple? if you'd want to pickle an apple. Frozen. You can freeze, freeze them. them. Yeah. yeah. So it's even an economically more viable choice, but it takes a lot of skill and knowledge to not put it in the can and then open it in the middle of December and it'd be moldy or gross. And forethought. Yeah. Like because um, they, they had to plan ahead. Basically mm-hmm. until like what a hundred years ago, yeah, you had you just, you just had to. So that's what you did. And I want to talk. I'll go off. What do I say? Off of left wing. Off the rails. No, it's like <laughs> left field. Oh, okay. but it is a little bit left wing as well, because <laughs> politically people will always and I understand why. Like talk about they'll they'll pull you up for what you just said about force. Mm-hmm. It'd be like people will be forced to be creative or forced to think ahead and that kind of thing because of scarcity. And I was thinking about that a little bit. The, the past few days because um, it's, an, it's an often held critique of environmentalists that they kind of, why would you root for that kind of authoritarianism that let's say limits your electricity use or limits your carbon emissions or limits your groceries or that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But when I say force, I think in the solar scene we'll have achieved such a, like it's a, it's a utopia is the whole point. So we'll, we, we've achieved like this political and individual enlightenment to the point that people understand that the best thing to do is to choose their own hardships in a way Mm -hmm. so it's like they understand that the best thing for their own um, enlightenment as i said and that of the world and community is not going to the grocery store every night for apples whatever the day of year or for mangoes Mm -hmm. it's that kind of like it's a it's a chosen thing is what i'm saying like it's not a top-down limitation not really anyway not in the solar scene yeah 
I just wanted to point. I know you didn't really mean it that that deeply, but mm -hmm. I, 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 it's a critique that a lot of people have, and I understand why. Like I said, but yeah, I mean, as soon as someone, if someone said what I just did to me, I'd probably think, ugh. But yeah. it's like we need this. Otherwise, if we just have everything we want, never have any hardship, yeah, it leads to mental illness. Well, it's the same way that people. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it leads to um, bad things. I'll put it like that. Sometimes <laughs> it leads to some bad things. But it's the same way that someone might say on their on their month off, like I forced myself to get out of bed mm -hmm. early, not like a depressed person, but like I forced myself to wake up yeah. early, it's, or I forced myself to go to sleep early. It's like no one forces you to do that. Like that's yeah. not what we're advocating for. Yeah. Yeah. I just I wanted to mention that. My yeah. next thing, I had a quote that I kind of forgot to say for the farming. <laughs> Um, but it was on this this website called Garden Culture Magazine. Sounds like my kind of thing, right? It was an article, and it opened with, to treat somebody or something like dirt is defined as behaving unfairly, rudely, or with very little respect. It's a common saying in the English language, one that is very fitting, considering how we treat dirt. Yeah, it is. And I like that. And maybe that goes along with your first thing about giving thanks. Yeah. Which is, why would you say, like, oh, we're going to treat people like dirt? Let's treat the dirt yeah. how you want to be treated. I mean, last week I was talking about how I wanted to eat it, or two weeks ago or yeah. something. But I'm not saying that. Anyway, my next thing is um, about sleep and the circadian rhythm, mm -hmm. the famed circadian rhythm, which I feel like people often just parrot. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, well, our circadian rhythm is off. is off, or it's disrupted. I feel like disruption goes with circadian rhythm in the same way that roaming goes goes hand in hand with dinosaurs to an extent. Um, but I was like, what is this rhythm? What does it mean? Do you know? Is it the melatonin levels in your body? That's part of it. Okay. But basically, it's a very, very complex <laughs> um, process. It kind of just describes like a circadian th thing. It's not just in humans. Like animals have it, plants have it too. It just describes any kind of internal process that is on roughly a 24-hour clock. Yeah. Interesting. And the reason it's on like a 24 hour clock is because of this, the sun, generally speaking, like sunrise to sunrise. Mm -hmm. But when people say it's disrupted, what that kind of means in layman's terms, my understanding is that our circadian rhythm, for the most part, is not set to the sun anymore. Okay, it's just kind of well, it's willy set, nilly. To, set to your own lights, yeah. for the most part. It's like if you tend to wake up at five, put lights on, and go to sleep at midnight with lights on, then that's when your rhythm is, is set. That yeah, kind of thing. I had a few things along with the circadian rhythm. I'll just share them now because it's a good time. One is candles, bring back candles because of this. Hmm. It's like if the sun's down, we shouldn't just turn on all the lights. Yeah. Have candles, maybe have a fire if you have a fireplace. I had some numbers on that. Yeah. Because the lights are apparently measured in something called Kelvin, which loosely refers to like the color temperature. Okay. So if daylight is 6,000, mm -hmm. candlelight is about 1850. Okay. So basically, what you want is light that is as different from daylight as possible. Mm -hmm. Moonlight, I think, was like three. Yeah. So that's what would usually be while you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. You were saying people, it's not like the sun goes down, people slept for all of history. It was like the sun goes down, people would still do things. Yes. Whereas I feel like the commonly held thing is, oh, well, you should go to bed with the sun and rise with the sun. Mm -hmm. But there, that's not historically accurate. Well, I think, I think it's a weird historical um, blank spot. Where every time I look into it, there isn't just concrete evidence about these people went to bed at this time and did this. Mm -hmm. But one thing I read today was that, um, like we're talking about like many, many years ago, like before civilization. Yeah. Like I'm talking about like, like nomadic peoples and like hunter gatherers and stuff. Like often what would happen is people would go to sleep, let's say with the, with the sun, uh, with the sun sets and then sleep like four hours or something, wake up, gather some firewood, fix the fire, you know, use the bathroom, that kind of thing. Mm, temperature control, Keep watch, right? that kind of thing. And then go to sleep again and then wake up with the sunrise. Mm. And maybe they'd have a nap. Like, it's not so uniform. Like, when we say people used to, it's like there are a lot of different people are and a lot of different used to's because there are yeah. a lot of different times. But people used to never do what we do today. Like, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's... I just don't think it's very healthy. I just think, generally speaking, it's it's not so much just the negatives of artificial light i think it's the positives of sunlight like i just think it's a lovely thing waking up with dawn especially yeah is is a great thing and i also think this is anecdotal and for this 
fun. I was going to mention like a bunch of health stuff, but I didn't want to sound too like pseudoscientific. Yeah. What I wrote was I didn't want to sound too scientific yet, question mark, because <laughs> I feel like we'll probably have a health semester in the future. Yeah, once we, we can, can reference doctors and have people. Yeah, once we can have people on. Yeah. Um, but I didn't want to start talking about crystals or anything like that yet. But I was just thinking about like there's some countries, I think it's Iceland, just like a lot of European countries, and maybe some people do it in America. I'm not, I've never seen it, where it's like it's very common that they'll, they let their babies nap outside. Yeah, that is really in common. Their, in their strollers. Not during the day, but during the, oh, sorry, not during the night, but their nap during the day. And I just think that's a nice thing. And I feel like, generally speaking, we, we kind of, it's funny because no one really cares that much about sleep. And yet at the same time, everybody bemoans how bad their sleep is. Yeah. But it's not something that we direct a lot of conscious effort into yet. Mm-hmm. I don't want to sound like that guy who, that sleep guy who does uh, <laughs> the TED Talks or whatever. But sleep is bad. It should be more, more circadian. Mm-hmm. Let me put it like that. I think also alarms. 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 I don't like alarms. I think those are awful. Yeah, down with alarms. Up with roosters. Up with roosters. <laughs> God's alarm. <laughs> exactly. Or if you have a cat or a dog, I feel like they're also God's alarm because they will. Yeah, not mine though. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the topic of light and sleep. I was thinking also about living seasonally. So it's living circadially, but... Circadianly? Sure. Okay. I can't say it. Circular. Living in a circle. Okay. Yeah. So living with the seasons and letting it determine your activities a bit more. This has obviously changed since we had food year round, have light day round. So just letting just letting yourself go to the seasons. Maybe you sleep way less in the summer, sleep more in the winter. Maybe you are more active in the summer less active in the winter. That was just a side note of my last thing. But I also wanted to bring up pilgrimage, hunt, those types of things, which is a very Aaron, Aaron Cole? trope. Okay. Um, encouraging people to hunt or is it? have a pilgrimage. Am I, am I big about hunting? Not that you ever have or I ever have. So, But I think <laughs> some from? kind of social... Being social outside. Yeah. In nature. And like also kind of a coming of age or a quest. ceremonial quest. Yeah. And this is very hard to define. We kind of designed a quest in the education series, I think. Yes. So some kind of a pilgrimage, even if it's just my pilgrimage is going to be once a year, I'm going to take a day where I don't talk to anyone and I just walk around the city or I walk around the woods and just kind of having some kind of ritual and ceremonial time in nature, which has always been a part of mainly coming of age things, but also just... It was just the fabric. It was just what we did. The reason yeah. it's hard to come up with them now is because <laughs> it used to just, that used to just be everything. Yeah. Like all of the year used to just be things we do outside mm-hmm. together to do, to gain something. Yeah. Like what about the, the autumn apple picking? That mm-hmm. might be a, a modern day equivalent. Yeah. Or one of the few remaining ones. The pumpkin patch. Yeah, the visit. pumpkin patch. That's one. That kind of thing. The sledding. Yeah. Something like that. So I just think bringing that back, that's kind of obvious, but still thought we'd mention it. I think it's it's relevant because later on we're going to be talking a little bit about life cycles, just as a, a much smaller part of today's episode. Different lifespans of organisms and kind of what it what it makes us think about. It's mm-hmm. not so much towards designing the solar scene, but just a, a nice nature conversation topic. Yeah. And I think that seasonality discussion is, is kind of central to that. Um, my next one was about environmental personhood, the legal concept of treating a river as a being. Mm-hmm. So they have rights, and so you can't abuse it, let's say, in the same way that you couldn't abuse a person, there would be legal consequence. And this, it's kind of a, a murky one in terms of bringing it back, because I know it's been in the news, especially, what let's say, over the last decade or so. It's been a lot of different cases in the USA and Canada, I'm sure in other countries as well, but it isn't, as far as I know, a federally recognized thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas almost every indigenous culture has some version of this, which I yeah. think is, is really fascinating. Like it was just a very common thing that things would go to trial or go to community discussion regarding like, oh, this person has been taking too much from the river. And it's it's not just that it's not fair to us, it's not fair to the river. That's mm-hmm. kind of the way they would they would put it. 
And it was weird because this just sounds like it should be in some way like a common sense inclusion into most, what are they called? Like charters? Yeah, most, most laws. Most laws. But what's the collection of laws called? The... Most legal systems. Yeah. And I mean, like, corporations are people. Yeah. And under some, the law, so... Some places, yeah. Yeah. When I go to Wikipedia, it's like the pros and cons on this. And the pros and the pros are very obvious. Mm -hmm. And then the cons, there's one major one. I know this is like, this is the depth of my reading into things on Wikipedia, but <laughs> I really wanted a shallow explanation of the cons. And it just says, it was basically like, well, if we treat a river as a person and so we can sue on behalf of it, can a river be sued if, let's say, it floods and destroys a village? Yeah. And then it, it said it opens up this like can of worms with, money and it's like well who's gonna pay when we sue the river and, and i was like this is ridiculous yeah why can't you you could just do it as a one-way thing yeah so i think that was i think i i rolled my eyes which i rarely do that yeah just picture me like on my laptop reading wikipedia and then i see that and i go roll those eyes and i think oh brother yeah <laughs> <laughs> but environmental person i think that's a that's a cool thing yeah another thing i was thinking in the soul scene is that we will see ourselves as one with nature <laughs> <laughs> in that right now it's like we're trying to fix it in the soul scene i think it'll be like the organism trying to fix itself and just kind of like our body if you cut it you don't have to think about it it just fixes it so in the soul scene if an issue arises because it's kind of post climate change it's like we've fixed it things are sustainable yes. but if a new problem arises it's just like the organism will work together, we'll learn from nature, mm -hmm. we'll help nature, and we'll just... We'll each be a, a blood cell clogging the... Yeah. Clotting, I mean, the scar. <laughs> yeah, and like, for a lot of people, this is just how they think about things. But others, we see ourselves as very apart from nature. So I think more people should see themselves as one with nature. My last one is about raw material craft. Stone, fabric, clay, mm. wood, bamboo. I feel like everybody should have one of these things that they're good at. Maybe it's because like in RPG games you have the mage, the healer, mm -hmm. the swordsman, the assassin. Yeah. So I feel like everybody should have a little RPG, but I don't know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> this kind of craftsmanship obviously has been outsourced where now we didn't build this table, didn't make the apartment, didn't paint, didn't mix the paints, didn't sew these clothes, didn't do anything, didn't build anything basically. Mm -hmm. But Obviously, it's it's symptom of the solar scene degrowth economics that we want people to be more DIY, hands-on, local, of course. Mm -hmm. But also, I just think, feel like from an individual perspective, it's kind of an ego boost, but a healthy ego boost or a self-esteem boost to see yourself master over some domain. I'm the stone guy. Yeah. Maybe it's Avatar as well, the anime, not the movie. <laughs> I think this is, when we first asked this question, clay pots is what came to mind and it's like that's not really an old nature practice but it's like having things that are made out of one thing yeah so clay is just clay wood is just yeah. wood but now we have but i was thinking about doing those things yourself at least to some extent yeah like it also makes you less less reliant which is a good thing mm -hmm. don't rely on ikea so much and i think it it really limits people's consumption because if you have made a pair of pants, and I mean like made it, I'm talking about working with the raw material, so you've grown the cotton or whatever it mm -hmm. may be, or the, the, the sheep, then you understand, like, these things are hard to make. And this yeah. takes a lot of time and a lot of plants. Or even if you've made, let's say, a loaf of bread from growing the wheat yourself, you realize that it actually takes like a few square feet mm -hmm. just of wheat. And then I'm talking about wheat later, that's why this comes to mind. And then like, <laughs> x amount of days to grow it a lot of process to refine the you know the grain and then you just eat the bread and it makes you not want to throw away the crust let's say mm -hmm. or with the pens it makes you not want to buy a new pair every year because it's like that took actually a long time to to make yeah i think having these skills also makes you feel really useful to your community and that you can skill share or also just skill share is yeah. this episode sponsored by <laughs> Okay. You can skill swap. Yeah. I suppose you, you could can say Squarespace. <laughs> <laughs> Better help. <laughs> <laughs> you can either share those skills, or everyone gets a bowl for Christmas because that's your thing, and that's, people love it. They wait for your, your annual. Do, yeah. Tiny bowls is kind of your thing. Yeah. 
Pottery is my thing this year, my new skill. And it's just kind of like a cool, to give something useful. It's like, yeah, you can maybe make a DIY soap or something just kind of random that isn't useful. Soap's not a good example. But a lot of the DIYs when you type in on Pinterest is just kind of novel things. You definitely offended a lot of the people who listen to the podcast who make soap or candles or me. No, but those things are useful. I'm think I'm trying to think of these Pinteresty. It'll just be like a, a wreath made of leaves. Yeah, I don't right. know. I can't think of these examples. But just type in like DIY gift ideas on Pinterest, and it'll be a bunch of things that are like it's DIY, but it's not. I feel like it will involve a palette. Palette, a, a, a mason palette. jar for sure. Yeah. But I, I mean, these, yeah, more raw things. Soap is honestly a good thing to make. Or You're talking sewing. about the mason jars that will have like rocks in and then some soil on top of that, some more rocks, and then maybe like some beans Yeah. as decoration. Exactly. No offense to whoever makes those. <laughs> yeah. That's the end of my rant on Pinterest. Speaking of Pinterest, the organism of the week for this week, I'm sure you can find it on Pinterest. Do you want to describe it for the audience, Alicia? Or the people who are watching YouTube, they can see for the free blue themselves. blue mycelium mushroom. No. What is it? It is a mushroom. I realized my drawing wasn't ideal, but this one on the left, that's the cap. And this one is the underside of the cap. They're yeah. two mushrooms. Okay. Um, it's purple. Uh-huh. Um, it's called the Amethyst Deceiver, which I really Whoa, like that name. That is it a sounded really like intense name. Super villain or something. Otherwise known as Wes. Fasaria amethystina. And it's a purple mushroom. Cool. There isn't much else to say about it, <laughs> but I was looking up cool mushrooms because I feel like it's been a while since we featured a fun guy mm. besides myself. And this one, it just looked really beautiful. I think mushrooms, we talked a lot before about how they embody both death and also your tiny ambitions to live on one or under one. Yeah. But I think also there's like a third aesthetic element to mushrooms, which is the fantasy series in which like mushrooms, crazy mushrooms populate the caves, yeah. the crystal caves, and they're like sparkling colors. And that's what this one looks like. So that's why I chose it. And the name also kind of contributes to that. They are an edible mushroom, but apparently they're not very nice. So mm. don't try unless you're a big mushroom mollogist. And also apparently they resemble quite a poisonous mushroom quite closely so yeah purple yeah. things i feel like they're not usually no good i wouldn't for you. no yeah i would kind of admire it from afar and then i'd probably run <laughs> away um <laughs> screaming apparently they can also they have a proclivity to absorb arsenic from the soil oh. so that obviously can be problematic when you're trying to eat them they're very bright purple but the color fades with age mm. and also like weathering they can dry out and they get really pale mm. pretty much white so that's why they're called the deceiver i see yeah um, the cap is one to six centimeters in diameter. The stem, five to ten centimeters long. Common in Europe, Asia, Central America, North America, South America. That's just all the, all continents. All the continents except for America. Um, late summer to early winter growers, often accompanying beech trees, oak trees. And then I was kind of like, I should actually mention something organ, orgaz, org- <laughs> Organismical. <laughs> yeah, I should actually mention something organismical um, or organismic about fungi because I didn't know what these guys were, the spokes on the wheel, mm-hmm. so to speak, the ridges underneath the cap. Do you know what those are called? No. Finally, I stumped you. <laughs> They're called gills. Ooh. Yeah. So this type of mushroom obviously has gills. It's where the spores come from. Oh. But not every mushroom has gills. Sometimes they have pores. So mm-hmm. like instead of lines like that, they're just little dots. Yeah. And sometimes they have teeth, which mm-hmm. are like these kind of, there's a lot of protrusions like teeth. Interesting. So there you go. Gills, paws, and teeth. Remember that it'll be on the end of semester quiz. Oh, goodness. Speaking of organisms, this week we decided to feature a few organisms and talk about their life cycles, as Aaron was alluding to. I only chose one. Did okay. you choose multiple? Um, wheat, I already mentioned, because I didn't know anything about wheat. As I said, I didn't know anything about farming. And I, I came out of it not knowing too much about wheat because I feel like farmers are kind of like magicians. They don't like telling outsiders about all their mm-hmm. all their techniques. You need to go live on a farm for a few months. No, that's just what you want to do. And you're trying to <laughs> convince me to do that with you. Um, <laughs> Maybe I am. But wheat typically planted in spring. It is harvested about 100 to 120 days later. So like mm-hmm. three to four months 
And then it is cut, dried, threshed. You know what that is? I know threshing. Walloping. Mm -hmm. Winnowing. Winnowed, and then milled, and then baked, eaten, and probably pus. But I just thought about, the reason I want to talk about life cycles is like, if you live on a farm, let's say you're a kid, and you see this wheat, and maybe the dad is like a really big guy, he's like, mm. come on, Jimmy. And he throws him some wheat, wheat seeds or wheat berries, as they're often called. And the kid casts them out. It's like magic. It's like pollen. Yeah. He's casting them out. Maybe he even blows them from his hand and says a wish or something. But then this big machine comes and, you know, plows it or whatever. Yeah. But the kid has thrown the seed himself. And then every day he watches it, waters it. Three to four months later, eats it. And then, as I say, passes it. It's like he... He, from a young age, the cycle of birth to death is ingrained in him mm -hmm. in a way that we don't have because my sister didn't know like where what beef was. It's like, oh, well, that comes from cow? What on earth? Or like you plug in um, a wire into the wall and it's like, you don't know what's happening. It's just this magic mm -hmm. thing. So we don't have an understanding of process or we've forgotten it. So it kind of goes with the previous question, but that's that's a little bit why I wanted to talk about lifespan. Mm -hmm. Because with death, it's like if you are surrounded as humans were for most of their evolutionary history with the death of plants and animals, then when your parents die, like it sounds morbid, but when your parents die, you're better prepared for it. You understand mm -hmm. it a little bit more. And yeah. I feel like now it's just it's like a knife every time. Like it's always been sad, I mean. Yeah. Maybe this is getting a little bit left left wing or left field or whatever but i think it prepares you yeah for for the death of your loved ones yeah for sure or of pets or of a tree like for all these things so right now we just don't know how to deal with it maybe we just see it happen and it's like oh that happened and then you kind of just don't integrate it at all and it just always weighs on your conscience speaking of weighing on your conscience kangaroos right do you want me to guess how long they live A kangaroo, do you know how tall it is? I don't know how tall it is. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm trying to think about Kangaroo Jack. He's the guy who boxes, right? Yeah. He's probably gone now. So I'm going to guess 12 to 16 years. So they live six years in the oh, wild. Really? Wow. 20 in captivity. Okay. So. I feel like I always overestimate it. It's animals. quite variable. I really thought the kangaroos would live 30 years. Like, they seem very... They're kind of like a megafauna, like they're big. I don't they're, think they're that big, though. I know, they're like three feet. I feel like we've been sold an image of kangaroos through cartoons. I've yeah. probably seen many more kangaroo cartoons than I've ever seen like images <laughs> of kangaroo, of real kangaroos. Yeah. So it's kind of like if someone talked to you about a platypus, what's going to mm. come to mind, Alicia? Perry. Yeah. It's Little not going to be a brown thing. one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but kangaroos, they're like two, three. They're not that tall. Okay, you don't know. No, but they're not <laughs> as tall as like the average human. No, I know, I know this, I know. But I always thought they were. And they come in all different sizes. There's quite a few different varieties of kangaroo. Yep. And there's also these other, um, what are they called? Magpies, which look like kangaroos. But there's like tree kangaroos and they get smaller and smaller. So they're quite variable. But the average kangaroo, they all reproduce the same way, which is what I wanted to talk about because this, like I just kept reading and I'd go, what? Like just like. Why, you didn't know they had pouches? I knew they had pouches. Yes. But I didn't know what went on in these pouches. Okay. Didn't know what went on in the, this is going to be very biological, but in the birth canal. Did not know what went on there. So kangaroos have three uteri. One's for reproduction and two are for nurturing the embryos. This in itself, I was like, excuse me? Because, I don't know. We're very familiar with human biology. Not as much with kangaroo biology. So they have three uterus, and then they reproduce normally, sexually, and then they, normally for mammals, and then the egg is fertilized, and then the egg grows into an embryo for only one month in the uterus. And then, instead of embedding in the lining the way that it would in a woman, it is born one month old, about the size of a jelly bean. Oh, I didn't know this actually about the tiny kangaroos. This is like 
don't look up a picture unless you them. want to be noxious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's born a little embryo. Like if a human was born, this was okay, the equivalent yeah, of like it, we seven it. weeks. Yeah. And so it's born, comes out, and then the mother kangaroo knows it's giving birth. So it licks a line to guide this little embryo via smell. And it climbs up. It has two front legs, but the back legs are just stumps. Has no hair, can't see. It's, I mean, it's a month old. It climbs up into the pouch and then it attaches on to a teat and lives there for eight months in the pouch, growing the way that a baby would in a mom's womb and then was born. So, this nine month process, still a nine month process, but eight of it is just outside of the, like, it's, <laughs> out in the open which is kind of crazy and then it's in the pouch for those eight months and the last two months it starts kind of peeking out but it still lives in the pouch it like root. yeah it doesn't go out and then after eight months it's officially a joey and it can go out and kind of graze start to learn things start to box and start to kind of learn the ways <laughs> but until it's about two years it still goes back into the pouch what okay so it still kind of sleeps in there and feeds in there a bit. But at two years, it's completely living off of the grass and grazing. Mm -hmm. But a mom can, within those two years, have up to three babies on the go. So you can have one in the uterus and it can freeze it. So if there's like, oh, not ready, like the pouch is occupied, it can get pregnant and just like stay pregnant for a while, which is okay. like crazy or if there's like a drought or a famine it can just kind of freeze the process and say hang on i'll get back to you and so it ha can have the one in utero it can have the the nursing kangaroo who's just like attached in the pouch and it can have one who's outside of the pouch sometimes in the pouch sometimes and because those are all very different stages of development it can produce different kinds of milk within its body to give these different animals right at a different times in the development. Milk, strawberry, strawberry yeah. And I just, this was one of the most crazy things. And I know probably 90% of animals reproduce in crazy ways. And this probably is like the least crazy. But it still blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you went way, way into detail with that. <laughs> like, I'm a little bit uncomfortable talking to you about it now because you sound so amazed by it. Hopefully it's the most health class so it never gets. <laughs> But no, that's interesting. So three and different types of milk. That's what I'm going to take away from it. Yeah. And very small. That's um, crazy. The one that I came up with, <laughs> I have one line about it, which is koi fish. Basically just different colored cup. 40 to 100 years in right conditions. 100 year old fish? Yeah. Yeah. There was Goodness. one that they, they looked at the, like the rings on its scales akin to a tree. And they estimated by those that it would have been over 200. But I'm oh, not sure goodness. how much stock I've been to that. So I'm going to lean closer to, closer to 40. Yeah. And I was thinking about having these as a pet instead of a dog or something. Because dog, you know when you get it for your kid, it's not going to end in... It's going to end in tears. For the fish, it might outlive them. Yeah. <laughs> the fish might be the one crying in the end. That's what the goal should be. <laughs> Generational, instead of like heirloom jewelry and stuff, it's just like heirloom, the heirloom pets. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. But... This doesn't really relate to the soul scene, does it? Besides that there'll be more knowledge of these no, things. No, but I, see, it's, I just think it's a it's <laughs> a discussion to have and it makes you think about how many turns we get around. I'll talk like Neil deGrasse Tyson, how many turns we get around this, this little, <laughs> yeah. on this little rock or something like that. Um, the final question for today was about tree houses in mm -hmm. the soul scene. Obviously quite a small discussion, unless you prepared pages again, like with the <laughs> kangaroos. No, I think it was, a, it was good. I like hearing about you get interested in the things. It was nice. So, oh, I, I also see another forgotten practice to bring back in the solo scene that I just kind of etched in here. I put running in all caps, question mark. So, just running places instead of walking. Because the reason oh. we don't do that now is because our shoes are bad and we're worried that we'll smell. I assume it's oh, the just like reason. I'm going to run to work. Yes. Yeah. But not like, oh, I'm going to run. Let me get on my neon t-shirt and yeah. headband. It's just, instead of walking, I will run. Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to run to the cafeteria. <laughs> yeah. I like this idea. In Switzerland, they just kind of ski places. Yeah. The way you, that we might bike places. Yeah. And I'm really obsessed with that idea. I know. You've been saying it a lot since last week. <laughs> <laughs> Dropping into a living on a farm and moving to Switzerland. 
Um, the hints will keep coming. So tree houses. I think in this whole scene, generally speaking, people should climb more, swing more, mm -hmm. return a, bit, a little bit to our simian, our monkey roots. And then I have recreating the treehouse interactivity with our architecture. Mm -hmm. Genuine treehouses in buildings also. So in terms of like recreating the treehouse energy, those like little walks? Sky, skywalks, skywalkways. Oh, yeah. Um, maybe a rock climbing wall outside the building. My office oh. is on the second floor. I don't want to take the elevator. Bap, bap, like that. Maybe there could be a harness. Like, why not do that? If, yeah. if you're harnessed in, why not have that? Because it's too fun, right? Exactly. Why not run to the wall and climb it? Zip lines. Yeah. I'm going to keep talking about zip lines. I think those are great. Slides. Not in like a, I work at Google, look, we're sliding down, we're so fun. But just in like, yeah, it's a slide. <laughs> That's Because if you work on the third floor, why not slide down? Why not? I always see in construction sites, they have those big orange mm -hmm. tubes, right? They throw down bricks or something. Why not just a person? I don't see why not. There's no reason not to. Verticality, funness, playgrounds. Yeah. Basically. And then regards specifically tree houses. These are good for children. Very good for children. I think because just from like a developmental point of view, climbing trees in general, that helps hone your your physical capabilities. Dexterity. Your dexterity. It lets you test your physical capabilities, especially mm -hmm. in a way that no indoor play ever can. Because the thing with trees is that it's such a, like to use like video game uh, terminology, it's such a, you can kind of choose your own difficulty curve. It's like, do you want to go to the first rung? Do you want to keep going higher? It doesn't really get harder in most cases, but the risk becomes greater. So it's about mm -hmm. your decision making and your risk assessment as well. Like it's, yeah. And we trust relatively young kids with that. So I think yeah. it's kind of cool. More parkour. Parkour, you think yeah. it's good in solo scene? Yeah. Yeah. I was also thinking tree houses are good for kids' autonomy and their creativity. Mm. Because it's like you don't really want your kid kind of destroying their bedroom. Like there's some restrictions there because it's like where they sleep. Okay. So it's like, yeah, maybe their space, but it's also there's some restrictions. But in a tree house, like if they want to just paint the walls, mm, nail yeah. things to it, do some renovations, like it's very That's a good point. creative and also hands on, obviously. That reminds me because that just reminds me of every time I used to clean my room when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I was always obsessed with wanting to do like things to it. Mm -hmm. Like in the episode of Seinfeld where Kramer says he's building a loft. Yeah. Or he's building a second floor. Levels. I always wanted to do yeah, levels. <laughs> I always wanted to do something like that. Yeah. I never did because I didn't like hammer into my wall. Yeah. But I always just wanted I would like make little maps of what I want my <laughs> room to look like or like, well, I'm gonna make a little crawl space there and that'll be my retreat. <laughs> But a treehouse, yes, you're right. It could be like the fortress of solitude for, for the children. Yeah. And then I think, obviously, adults could, in turn, if they grew up with treehouses or <laughs> treehouse-adjacent spaces in their neighborhoods. Oh, my goodness. This just came to me. Like in recess, the fort. The jungle the, gym. But the tire fort. Oh, where the kindergartners. Where the, the like, mall girls went, I think. And there were, like, mm. tunnels and stuff. Oh yeah, the Ashleys. The Ashleys. Right. Yeah, okay. I didn't couldn't remember the names. Like I was getting mixed a... up there because Recess <laughs> had a weird amount of like notable geography. Yeah. It's like a map like in Lord of the Rings. They have like Death Mountain. There's the kindergarten there, like yeah. a retreat. There's the, the jungle gym, obviously, with King Bob and the diggers. The... Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah. So it's like not just every kid needs their own treehouse. It's like a community it could just be called the treehouse, but where the kids can kind of just do their own thing. It's like <laughs> If you guys want some wood, like we'll give you some <laughs> the wood. Underground you can use it. pits where the kids will have all <laughs> mole networks. Yeah, but like just let them have some of their own space. And then obviously, was, if they grew up with that, the adults would internalize this creativity. Yeah. <laughs> last year, I was trying, or last week, I was trying to remember your names for the girl guides and the boy scouts. Yeah. But that was it, right? It was the moles. Because you had one for the earth, one for the land, <laughs> and one for the air, like in the military. Yeah, it was the like military. the mighty moles. There were like the sky <laughs> walkers. I don't think that's what they were. I guess I can. Yeah, that, so that's what I'm saying. The moles could maybe build this place for the other people. Yeah, that's what they do. Or the sea people could make their own as well. Timber titans, yeah. salty scouts, <laughs> dirty dreamers, <laughs> and the air walkers. Yeah. Oh, you had four? Yeah. Yeah, the air walkers. I don't think they have a lot of things to do. They fly kites and like make model airplanes <laughs> or something. Okay, yeah, that one's kind of lame. But I designed my own, my ideal treehouse in the spirit of the solo scene. Okay. Did you do the same thing or...? Um, no, but I can tell you about my treehouse from a kid when I was a kid, maybe. Oh, you had one? I thought you didn't. 
It wasn't in a tree because my dad didn't want us to hurt ourselves. Oh, okay. Well, let me design mine. You can kind of grade it. Okay. So first things first, the way you get up there is a rope ladder. Because I feel like that would be slightly more difficult to climb. And more importantly, it's retractable. Mm -hmm. So if I get up there, oh, no one understands me. I just lift it up and yeah. nobody can reach me. Space for angst. Possibly a bad idea, but a space for angst. And uh, yeah, space I can just be left alone, like literally, like no one could reach me if they tried. Mm. Unless they called 911 or something. Um, a small bookshelf, this is the, the, the inside, a small bookshelf, a rug for laying. Because I feel like I do a lot of laying on my back. Yeah. Like looking up out the window, kind of at an angle. A food stash, naturally. Should probably get very infested with insects very quickly, mm -hmm. but I'll I'll keep trying to replenish it anyway. Um, and then one of those cans with the string mm -hmm. via which I can communicate with the other neighborhood, either tree houses or kids, or as you say, the place that the dirty dreamers build. Yeah. Do you think that one of those would be like feasible on a neighborhood level? I really don't know. Community scale. You could have like a pipe system. Yeah. I know those work. You shout into the pipe. No, I like the string. Because it just seems so, like, that's never going to work. Maybe we can test like, that out tonight. You keep trying it. Um, we'll report back. And then also a window ledge slash nook for, for sitting, contemplating. I feel like I do a lot of thinking. Mm. Um, I think a lot, you know. I'm very Not smart. like other kids. I'm a very smart kid. <laughs> and also an easily accessible roof for sitting. Mm. That's what I Plus sitting, laying, thinking. Uh, <laughs> for what Smacking. else do you do in a treehouse? You eat, you read. Maybe I have a little, like, laughably old-fashioned radio yeah where i can like hack into the what the police, police. are saying <laughs> <laughs> there's always like kid movies but i feel like they're no yeah it's much like tree houses those are wildly overrepresented <laughs> in film those don't, that doesn't happen in real life um and then the last thing was in or besides an apple tree for easy pickings mm. i wrote pickings with no g just because i feel like if i was in tree house that's how i talk and you could start calling me huckleberry most likely yeah is that close to what you had? Obviously, yours was not in a tree, so probably not at all. No, not at all. Well, mine was like, mine was three stories. Whoa. Which sounds very exciting, but when you are three feet tall yeah. to four feet tall. It was like a dollhouse. Yeah. So it was like you went in, there was a ladder, and there was like a first floor, and we eventually built a little table where we put a microwave oven that we found on the side of the street. <laughs> there was no electricity, so like we couldn't yeah. actually use it for anything, but sometimes you pretend to bake like mud pies. There was a raccoon in it, but we got rid of that. There were raccoons. Okay. I wish you were joking, but there was. <laughs> um, so then there were just kind of like holes for windows, and you'd climb up, and there were two levels up there, but just like one split into two. And that's where if we'd have sleepovers, we'd sleep up there because we were afraid of being stolen. So we thought if we're sleeping on the third floor, no one's going to be able to get to us. How, f how high up was the third floor? Uh, probably like seven feet. It was okay. like kind of tall. So perfect height for a man to go by and reach. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's yeah. The top shelf. And that was about it. We painted the walls on the inside and then would kind of have like rules, like no fighting. That was about the only rule, I think. No fighting? Yeah. No swearing? Well, there was no swearing. Okay. How old were you? 12 was like the oh, peak. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, it's still, you would have seen it. Okay. But yeah. Um, what color was the wood originally? It was just plywood. So, so light. Yeah. I feel like in tree houses... The weird thing is that the wood is always dark brown mm -hmm. in, in cartoons. This is. Yeah. It's like, where is this wood that they're getting? Because all the wood problem. that I see in hardware stores or people using is always white. Yeah. So I feel like that's another element of mine is that it should, be, it should match the tree, yeah. which is basically impossible unless you paint it that color. Mm -hmm. But I guess you could just use a dark wood. What am I talking about? Yeah. Let it be weathered. Weathered, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it has to have like the, those grains, like along the grains, it has to be yeah. little holes in it. Yeah. Like it can't, be, it can't be nice wood, basically. Mm hmm. And it has to be kind of falling apart. Like Always. every time you go, your mom's like, well, don't fall through the floor today. And you're like, I got it, mom. But then one day you just do. <laughs> you do. <laughs> Have a heart to heart moment when your one of your parents climbs up and offers you like. Hey, Skip. Skip. I know you're going through a hard time, but this is just becoming oh, no, a they, sketch. They make up, a, like they add a string and a can to the network. Yeah. And they're like calling Chief Scout or something. Like they call you something. <laughs> like that. Call him boss boy. Yeah. Come in. Need you for dinner. Pork to the kitchen for dinner. Yeah, that's just... only using military terms, but <laughs> got into the military. So tree houses in this whole scene. Yeah. We didn't come up with any questions for next week. So mm. perhaps 
we can do one now and then a couple over the, during the week. Yeah. Maybe we could have a, if anyone's listening to this, can re- maybe request a question. Yeah, do that. That'd yeah. be fun. We'd love to hear it and then we'll try and answer it. Either do it through the email, which you can find on our website, which is linked, or on Instagram. We're on Instagram as well, right? You can message yeah. us there. It's just solo scene. Mm-hmm. Is that all it is? Yeah. Okay. So question for next week would be... That's just you being lazy, I know, but okay, <laughs> we can do that. No, but I thought over the next few weeks, maybe if anyone submits one, we can try and answer it. Would be fun. Mm-hmm. Bye.